you. Amen. All right, and good evening to the rest of you. We, uh, we're driving here this evening, and I was, I was admiring the, the leaves that were changing. Uh, I was kind of worried this year because it's been so dry that we wouldn't have a, a change of, of leaves, that it would go straight from green to brown, but it didn't. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, you know how some trees are just made for October. You know, we had a, we had a tree down the street from us growing up. I think it was like a sugar maple, maybe. And it turned like such a bright orange in the fall. And I thought about that, and I thought, man, you know, God, God must have made that tree for October because in its season, it does what it does to the glory of God. And uh, I was thinking about that, and I thought to myself, self, I thought, I feel like we have a, a season here on earth, like where we can do something that we can't even do in heaven, and that is to praise God through faith. Uh, having, having not seen him with our own eyes, we have the opportunity to proclaim that he's worthy. And when the people of God do what they're made to do in their season, it's a beautiful thing. So let's, let's do that this evening. Let's stand and out of faith, uh, praise the Lord, proclaim that he's worthy. Uh, we're going to start with hymn number 345. It's on the screen. Let's stand and sing. struggle to hit them high notes. Don't don't feel alone. I struggle too. All right, our, our next song we're going to sing uh, is hymn number 500, if you're using your hymnal. The Longer I Serve Him. I 
seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before before uh, Brother Dave comes to bring the word. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, we praise you because you're worthy, because serving you is sweet. God, because you take our, our lives that were, were empty, uh, that were broken, and, and you make them whole. God, I thank you because for those of us who, who know you, uh, we know that you, you came to give life. And you came to give it to the fullest. And Lord, I, I pray that our lives will always reflect that. Um, God, I, I, I pray this evening, uh, as, as we're about to hear from your word, God, I, I pray draw us close to you and, and deal with us as, as your children. Uh, Lord, look. Look tenderly on us, and, and I, I pray, um, reveal your, your heart to us. Um, God, call us into, into greater things, and into greater joy and, and greater service. And Lord, I, I, just, I pray that uh, we'd walk out of here more in love with you, more committed to you. God, I, I pray a, a blessing for uh, all of us that are here, and, and Lord, I, I pray that when this is over, that, that we could all be be one in our, our devotion, um, in, our, uh, in our understanding of your word, God, in our, our desire to serve you, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Great to be in the house of the Lord. If you agree with that, would you say amen? It's great to have a little more of a voice tonight than I had last night. The trajectory is upwards, and I'm thankful for that. And I just want to say this to you tonight. I enjoyed walking around, shaking hands with everybody, and fellowshipping a little bit before the service. And I just want to say this because it is the truth. I love you folks. I really do. I want you to know that. And I'm thankful that you're here. If you're visiting tonight, well, you're our honored guest. And we appreciate you being here. If you're from another church, uh, we're thankful that you've chosen to come. If you're not from any church, but you've chosen to come, we're especially thankful that you're here. If you're a member of Daniel's Missionary Baptist. Your pastor would say you ought to be here. I guess I would agree with him, but we don't take that for granted. We're glad you're here, and thank you so much for carving out the time to honor the Lord and come listen to what God has to say to all of us, not all of you, but all of us. I'm included in that from God's Word. Can I just share with you something that's a great blessing for me today? Uh, my son sent to me, I've got it on my phone, if you want to see it, I'll show it to you. But he sent me a picture of he and uh, the other gentleman that's on our staff in Washington, D.C., Dr. George Roller, standing on either side of a particular U.S. congressman. And I tell Nathan all the time, I said, that guy's the best dressed guy on Capitol Hill. He really is. 
He's an incredibly sharp dresser, but he is a former sheriff, pastor sheriff of Manatee uh, County in Florida. He was also part of the JAG Corps uh, during Operation Iraqi Freedom. He's a wonderful guy, loves the Lord with all of his heart. But I'll tell you what impressed me and blessed my heart today. Nathan said, Dad, we were in his office. We had a great time talking to him. But what he said was, and this is one of the things that our team does on Capitol Hill, we have Bible studies for staffers. We have Bible studies for members of Congress. But we also do things like this. We train people up there on how to share their faith, on personal evangelism, on Capitol Hill. You do understand people are people. Everybody's the same, really, in many ways, everywhere. But you understand the makeup, the climate on Capitol Hill is a little bit different maybe than right here in Beckley, West Virginia, or Daniels, West Virginia, because of the nature of the way things are up there. And so what uh, George does, what Nathan does, and if I'm there, I do this. But we tag team together and train members of Congress on how to share their faith with other members of Congress. And this guy said this. He said, what I want to do is I want to take that Bible study on how to share my faith. Can I hear an amen right there? That is absolutely amazing. And I guarantee you CNN didn't say a word about that today. MSNBC didn't say a word about that today. Fox News didn't say a word about that today. And I can guarantee you ABC or CBS or NBC Network News did not and is not going to say anything about it. But we serve an awesome God. And I, what's happening is this. We've got members of Congress up on Capitol Hill that are understanding the nature of the times in which we live and that this is not just our moment, this is their moment to be a shining witness for Jesus Christ and they're endeavoring to find the most effective ways and additional ways to go about doing that. And so that blessed my heart. And uh, by the way, if you want to see a picture of who the guy is and want to know who he is, I'll tell you who he is uh, privately. But uh, you've seen him on the news. I promise you, you have. And, uh, but he loves the Lord, and I'm thankful for that. Now, I'm saying all that to start something for just a couple of minutes, and we're going to get right into the Word of God. We sung some psalms tonight, and our brother led them. Uh, I appreciate so much what he did. Uh, that kind of deal with a heart of thanksgiving and a heart of gratitude and praise. We ought to be thankful for what God's doing in our life. So what I'd like to do is this. I'd like to ask for maybe two people at the very least who would be willing just to stand to your feet and you don't have to preach a sermon, but just thank the Lord for something God's been doing in your life, maybe even today. It doesn't have to be today. It can be uh, this week. It can be in the last several weeks. But something God has done very recently in your life for which you would like to thank and praise Him. We ought to be praising God all the time. Can I hear an amen? We really should. But who will be two? At least two people will be willing to do that. To stand to your feet and tell us what God's been doing in your life. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. And God's people said, Amen. One more at least. One more. Amen. Yes, we do. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. Now that begs one more real quickly. No, one more. By the way, I want to say this. I thank God for this dear sister and the smile on her face. And uh, she's looking at a situation the way all of us ought to look at one, that God has a purpose for all these things. And he wants to do something, even if it's maybe something we would not choose to repeat happening again. But God has a purpose for that. One more, just one more quickly. Who will be willing just to praise the Lord for something he's done in your life? Thank him for what he's done in your life very recently. Anybody else? Come on now. I'm priming the pump here just a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Are all of you familiar, it was all over the news, uh, this, this you know, police officer that came home and she said, she, and I'm, again, I'm not questioning what she said, but uh, anyway, she thought she was in her own apartment and there was, she was actually in somebody else's apartment and she shot and killed the guy. And then, of course, uh, you know, the trial ensues and she was convicted, you know, of, uh, I guess it was manslaughter or whatever she was convicted of, maybe even second degree murder. I'm not sure what the actual sentence was. I don't remember. But I do remember the Texas judge, the female judge that pronounced the sentence against her and then got a Bible and walked down and took the Bible and read to her in the courtroom after the sentence was announced, John 3.16, and explained that and what precipitated her doing that was something similar to what you shared. The brother of the man she killed said this when he testified in the courtroom, I hold no animosity toward her. He said, I just hope that she'll commit her life to Jesus Christ and God can change her life. And he quoted some scripture in the court. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And see, this was absolutely a stunning, stunning moment. And then the judge does her job as a representative of the court. And once all that's over and done, she gets a Bible. I think the very one has understood it that, uh, you know, people took you know, their hand and placed it on and were sworn in to give testimony that day in the courtroom. She brings that one over, opens it up, and the media covers the entire thing, and uh, I'm sure they're going bonkers. In fact, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, you know, wrote, tried to bring some kind of lawsuit against the judge, you know, for stepping out of her bounds and, you know, violating the separation of church and state, you know, the misunderstanding of that. Well, anyway, it was an amazing, amazing moment. What I appreciated is this. There is a man who had lost a family member, but he understood this is about more than just my own personal loss. This is about a person here in the courtroom who needs Jesus. And he took advantage of that opportunity to share the gospel. And then on top of that, the judge was emboldened by his decision to follow up because she's a believer in the Lord and take the time to take a Bible and go down and share the gospel with that lady that's going to be serving, I think, 10 years in prison. And then watch how this magnifies. Then beyond that, the news media covers it because they're all so stunned that it's happening. And I don't know if you watch the coverage that I watch, but all these people, they've got all their judicial people there, their legal experts, and they're all talking while this is unfolding. As you're watching it on the screen, they're saying, I've never seen anything happen like this. I don't think I've ever seen the Bible brought over and read in the courtroom. And they're talking about all of this. Have you ever seen anything like this happen? And they're all discussing this. That now has literally gone around the globe. And the opportunity now that that is created for Jesus Christ to be mentioned, the gospel to be shared, Genuine forgiveness to be extended on the part of a family member who suffered a great loss. All of that has fallen out, as Paul says in his word, to the furtherance of the gospel. Can I hear an amen right there? So what I'm trying to say is this. Every day, every day, 
when things are going on. Maybe you sit at a traffic light longer than you're supposed to or you think you should. Maybe something happens uh, as it did today. I understand there was something going on down at the sheets or one of the sheets uh, here in the area. Uh, but anytime something like that happens, do you understand God can take that and he can turn it into something that can result in us having a chance to talk about our Savior and God use it in a wonderful way and a great way. So we need to be thinking that way. We need to consciously be thinking that way for the glory of the Lord. Well, I want you to take your Bible, if you would, please. I want you to look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And while you're turning, let me just say this. Paul told Timothy in uh, the first book of Timothy, or second book of Timothy, that he wrote to him, This know also that in the last days perilous, troublesome times shall come. He then lists a litany, a long list of things that are going to be characteristic of the last days, those troublesome times that are going to come in the last days. Would you listen to what Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. You ever seen a time in which people love themselves? In fact, we're being told today, the problem is you don't know how to love yourself enough. So you need to be taught how to love yourself. You know what the Bible says about that? No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. So, Brother Joe, what I'm trying to say is this. I don't think I need to be taught how to love myself more. I think my problem is I love myself too much. Is everybody with me? You know what I'm talking about? Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Listen to the rest of what Paul told Timothy. Covetous. Men shall be covetous, proud, boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Wow, we could camp out there for a little while, couldn't we? The end time is going to be a time of unprecedented disobedience, and I believe as an extension, dishonoring of parents which are a human authority. By the way, that is symptomatic of what's happening in our culture. All authority, human authority, is being defied today. And so that is a characteristic of the end time. Disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Paul told Timothy. By the way, listen, folks, it is not natural. There, it's not natural at all for a woman, forgive me, I'm not trying to, to, to be unkind to anybody, but it's not natural for a woman to want to abort her own offspring. Can I hear an amen? That's not natural. That's not normal. Sometimes the animal world treats their offspring better than humans do theirs. It is not natural in any sense of the term. For a man to burn in lust for another man or a woman burn in lust for another woman. By the way, in my home state of North Carolina, I don't know about West Virginia, but homosexuality years ago, in fact, if it's not been taken off the books last time I checked, I'm assuming it's still there, homosexuality was called in North Carolina on the law books a crime against nature because it's not natural. Are you with me? Without natural affection. Listen to what else Paul said. Truce breakers. People are going to make promises and not fulfill those promises in the end time. Fierce, which is the word that means ferocious. Have you ever seen a time like it in America where ferocious acts are committed by some human beings against other human beings? Have you ever seen any of these videos? They're heartbreaking. Where these guys will walk through some of the streets of inner city cities like San Francisco or Chicago and they'll beat up or kill homeless people who are sleeping. What kind of person does that? It's an act of horrible ferocity. Fierce, ferocious. Despisers of those that are good, Paul said to Timothy. Traitors, heady, arrogant, high-minded. Listen to this last one. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God from such turn away. Wow, that describes our culture almost to a T, doesn't it? situated in that laundry list of things that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write to Timothy that are going to be characteristic of the end times is one word that does not really seem to fit. All these other things seem to have a heinous nature to it, at least in our mind in the year 2019. But the one word that situates it almost halfway through the list, man, we don't think this one's that bad. In fact, we don't even really talk about it. Well, Brother Dave, what word are you referring to? It's the little word unthankful. Unthankful. Paul told Timothy, in the last days, perilous times are going to come. Here's going to be what it's going to be like. These things are going to be characteristic of the last days. 
And right in that list is the little word unthankful. Folk, have you ever seen anything like it? Unprecedented ingratitude. You ever been to a store? And by the way, I'm sorry, Miss Cindy, my dad taught me this. In fact, he'd come out of the grave and get me if I didn't do this. But when you go into a public building, my dad used to say, you as a man, son, should do this. You should extend your hand, grab the door handle, open the door, turn and look, and if there are any women or any ladies that are coming, you hold the door and let them go through first. That's what a gentleman does. That's what my dad said, so that's what I always do. By the way, I was at a mall not long ago and got to the door, let my wife and daughter go through, and I turned and looked, and here came a long line, and I'm not going to say they were ladies because... I'm not sure they were acting like ladies, but they were certainly women. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But they were approaching the door, so I thought, well, I'm going to hold the door for them. Well, there were six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the first one went through, and the second one went through, and the third, fourth, fifth. When the sixth one got ready to go through, Miss Cindy, she stopped and put her hands on her hips and stared me down and literally said this, well, I can do it for myself. Thank you. Now, I did not physically do this, but I did think it so if you know, I guess in, the, in God's sight, I did do it. When she got through, I thought, you know what I ought to do with this door instead of holding it like this? I ought to come around on this side. And when she gets through, I ought to boom, slam it and create a little bit of a domino effect. You know what I'm talking about? Now, I did not do that, okay? I did not. Unthankful. Wow. So heavy on my mind and heart is this word and was this word that I took my Bible and I started searching through the Scripture to help not you, to help me. Because I'm plagued with the same temptations you are. Listen, underneath my shirt is not an S on my chest. I'm not super Christian. I'm not super preacher. Listen, I want to grow in the Lord and I hope I'm more mature this year than I was last year. I certainly hope I'm more mature now than I was 20 years ago. But the bottom line is this. I'm made out of the same flesh you are. So I struggle with this thing of ingratitude. Lord, what do I as a believer, as a follower of you, what do I need to be thankful for? And I found some very interesting things. And I'm not going to give you the whole wagon load, all right? But I'm going to point out three of them very, very quickly. What I want you to see is the three things tonight that we ought to have an attitude of gratitude about. You say, preacher, what are they? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. By the way, the three passages I'm going to have you look at all have the word thanks, thanksgiving, some form of that word in it. And I want you to notice, if you would please, verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians 1. Now stay with me. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, writes these words. I, verse 4, what's the second word of the verse? I, would you say it out loud? What? Thank my God always on your behalf for, here's what he thanks God for, the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. By the way, this is an awesome starting point. This is the first thing every person in this room, if you're a believer, ought to be thankful for. Would you write it down? You ought to be thankful for forgiveness. Forgiveness from the penalty of your sin. That's what the word grace is referring to. Now, as soon as you write that down, forgiveness from the penalty of my sin, I want you to look up at me. I want to try to help you understand something. We have tried, Pastor, to define grace, God's grace, all kinds of ways. Some people call it God's riches at Christ's expense using the word G-R-A-C-E, the letters, as an anacronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. Pretty good way to define grace. Other people have said this. God's grace is this. It's God giving us that which we do not deserve. His mercy is withholding from us what we do deserve, but His grace is giving to us what we don't deserve. That's a good definition of grace. Can I be, just for the sake of understanding tonight, can I be a tad more theological, all right? And I'm not trying to impress you, I'm not trying to confuse you. But I want you to understand, God's grace is more than just God's riches at Christ's expense. It's more than just God giving us that which we don't deserve. You say, preacher, what is it? All right, here is a little more theological definition of the term. I'm going to say it slowly, maybe you can jot it down. God's grace is this. It is that act of God, that act of God whereby our offense was taken out of the way. It is that act of God whereby our offense was taken out of the way. Let me say it a third time. That act of God whereby our offense was taken out of the way. You see, preacher, explain. All right, let me give you a silly personal illustration. When I was in Bible college, I was uh, trying to carry 15 hours of seminary classes. And I'll tell you, Brother Joe, it was frustrating, and here's why. First class, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, first hour of the day, first class of the day, 8 o'clock was Hebrew. 
Hebrew, and Pastor Tim knows this, is the total opposite of English. You don't start at the front of the Hebrew Bible here. You start at the back of the Hebrew Bible. And Hebrew is not read like most things from left to right. It's read from right to left. So you start at the back and you work toward, as we would think here, toward the front of the book. So you get your mind in first hour thinking that way. As soon as that class is over, Miss Cindy, I walked across the hall and sat down in graduate level Greek. Well, Greek, you know, is read from left to right. And it starts at the front of the book like we traditionally read books here. By the time Brother Tim, those two hours were over, my mind was so confused. I didn't know where I was, okay? I'm just being honest with you. So at the end of the day, I would hop in my car, I would leave the college campus, and I would head back to the house where I was staying with my grandfather and grandmother there in South Carolina. And every afternoon, typically, here's what I do. The minute I pull the car into drive, my brain went into neutral. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I would start daydreaming. And brother, here's what I would be daydreaming about, especially that last year. I was daydreaming about this beautiful, dark-haired, dark-eyed, olive-complexion young lady from Texas that I was going to marry in 30 days. Her name was Betsy Silos, now known as Betsy Silos Kistler. And so I'd start driving, and I had about a four-mile ride from the college to where I lived with my grandparents, and my mind would be daydreaming about her. Well, one afternoon, it was in the springtime, the time when young men's heart turns to love, and so my mind and heart was on all of that. I'm going to get married here, and don't laugh too much, but anyway, I was going to get married in 30 days. So I'm thinking about her, and all of a sudden my daydream, my awesome daydream about this beautiful young lady came to an abrupt end. You say, what brought it to an end? This will do it every time. I looked up, and all of a sudden I realized I'm driving underneath a traffic light that has just turned red. All right? All of a sudden I'm thinking, oh my goodness. You know what you do? You're going this way, the lights turn red for you. So immediately at the intersection you look there and there to see if there's a police officer, right? That's what I do. Well, I look to my right. Sure enough, first automobile. The light had turned red for me. It's turned green for him. Sitting there is a police officer. And Brother Tim, he pulls right in behind me. Flips on his blue light. This is a five-lane highway. A lot of my college classmates drove up and down this road. I was embarrassed. I'd never been pulled over before. This was the first time. So I kept driving, trying to look for a side road. You know, I could pull up. That guy got irritated at me. He turned on the siren. Er, you know, get over, pull over. So I turned to the left down a little side road. He pulled in behind me, comes up to my car. He is upset. He said, sir, I need to see two things, your driver's license and your registration. I gave both of them to him. He looked at them, handed them back to me, and he asked me a question. He said, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, yes, sir, I think I have an idea. Shaking like a leaf. He said, why do you think I pulled you over? I said, because right back there, this is my exact phrase, right back there, I ran underneath a pink light. <laughs> Wrong choice of words, all right? Wrong. He exploded on me. He said, sir, you did not run underneath a pink light. That light was rose red when you ran underneath it. I pulled you over for a moving violation, running underneath a red light after it's turned red. I said, yes, sir, I ran underneath a red light. He said, you know what the, green, the, the penalty in Greenville County is for a moving violation, doing what you just did? I said, no, sir, I don't have an idea, but you're about to tell me. He said, I sure am. He said, in this county, if I give you a ticket, which I'm going to do, he said, it's a $72 fine. Now, it's way more than that now, Brother Joe. But as a college kid, getting ready to get married in a month, 72 bucks sounded like a million. And I'm going... <laughs> $72 fine. He flips open his pad. He wrote out the ticket, tore it off, handed it through the window to me. Brother Tim, I was so nervous. I reached up and I took the ticket he'd just written and I thanked him for it. I said, thank you. You probably don't get that, do you? Do you really? Well, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Kistler, can I make a suggestion to you? I said, yes, sir. Suggest anything you would like. He said, flip that ticket over on the back which I did. He said, look at the very bottom. There is a pre-printed date on the bottom of the ticket. Sure enough, there was. I noticed that the date printed was exactly 30 days from the day he pulled me over. He said, now I want you to take a look at that date and I'm going to make a suggestion. He said, now you don't have to do this, but I think it'd be to your advantage if you would. He said, do not, do not send in the payment for this ticket to the address just above that date. I said, no. He said, no. I said, why should I not do that? He said, because if you wait until this date, this pre-printed date, and show up in traffic court, that could really be to your advantage. I said, well, why could that be to my advantage? I mean, I didn't know. 
He said, well, if you show up in traffic court, they may reduce the fine. I said, how much might they reduce? I want to know if it's going to be worth my time. He said, well, I've known them to reduce it as much as 50%. I said, I'll be there on this date. So I waited the 30 days. It comes, it goes. The day of my traffic court appearance, I got up, got myself dressed, put on my nice you know, suit, put on my white shirt, my tie, and I head down to the Greenville County Municipal Building. Now, I'd never been there before. I knew where it was, but I hadn't gone in. So I arrived there, and there's an officer at the front door. I said, where do all the traffic violators meet? He said, if you'll go all the way down to the end of this hallway, last room on the left. So I walked all the way down to the end of the hallway, turned left. The room was about the size of this section of pews right here, maybe just a little bigger. And every chair except one on the front row, like church, was taken up. I walked in, preacher, I'm sure I was flashing like a neon sign. Bible college student, seminary student. I only went in there with a suit and tie. So I walk in, sit down. A guy walks in up front in a black robe. I found out that's the judge. Preceding him into the room is a guy in a blue uniform. I found out that guy is the bailiff. The bailiff comes in. He grabs a little hammer, it looks like. It's a gavel. And he hits it on the table and says, all rise. Well, everybody stood up, so I stood up. He said, the honorable judge, whatever the guy's name was, I don't remember, presiding, please be seated. Everybody sits down. The judge flips open a chart. There's listed evidently on the first page of that chart all the traffic violators that are there in court that day. He read the first name. Would you believe it? That guy hadn't showed up yet. So they read the second name. Anybody want to venture a wild guess who was number two on the list? Yours truly. John David Kissler. Sounded like my mom. When mom used all three names, I knew I was in trouble. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I stood up from the front row. I didn't have far to go. And I stepped out like this. My knees started shaking. I'm not kidding. Folks, if you had put cymbals on the inside of my knees, I could have played a cymbal solo. I mean, my knees were just shaking like crazy. When I stepped up in front of the judge... I noticed that the officer that had pulled me over 30 days earlier had been standing along the wall over there. He steps over and stands right beside me. And then the judge did this. He said, state your full name. Now, I didn't say this, but I thought it. Well, you just read my full name. Why do I need to state it? But he said state it. So I stated it, John David Kistler. He then said to the officer, would you state or read Mr. Kistler's offense? And so that officer started. He started and said, well, you know, basically I was at this intersection. He gave all the road names. And he said, uh, Mr. Kistler's car went whizzing through uh, the traffic light after it turned red, turned green for me. I pulled in behind him. When I finally got him pulled over, the officer said, he said, I wrote him a ticket, handed it to him. And he said, uh, Judge, I just thought you might be interested in knowing this. I handed the ticket to Mr. Kistler and he thanked me. The judge looked at me and said, how would you like to plead? I'd never been in court before. I wanted to do this, preacher. I'd like to plead like this. Please don't give that to me. But I didn't do that, okay? It's legal terminology, all right? How would you like to plead? I thought, well, there's no other way to plead. I was guilty. So I said, Judge, I plead guilty. He grabbed the gavel and got ready to hit it on the desk. And the officer did something that was absolutely amazing. He said, Judge, wait just a second. He said, I need to reiterate something to you. He said, I told you the day I pulled Mr. Kistler over that he thanked me, but I have not yet told you this. And I thought, what is he going to share? Here's what he shared. He said, when I pulled Mr. Kistler over, it was obvious he had never been pulled over before. He was very nervous. And he said, he told me this. He said, uh, officer, the reason I wasn't paying attention to my driving, not paying attention to the traffic light, was because I had my mind on this beautiful, dark-haired, dark-eyed, olive, and I remembered I had told him that. Well, he's now telling that to the entire room. I mean, the entire room is learning about my love life. Everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm standing there trying to go, shh, shh, don't say that. Well, he's just spilling the beans right there in the courtroom. He said, Judge, he told me about this. He's getting married to this girl here in a month. His mind wasn't on his driving. He said, uh, it's obvious it wasn't on his driving. But anyway, he said, when I gave him the ticket, he said, Judge, this is the part I really want to reiterate. Mr. Kistler took the ticket from my hand and thanked me for it. He said, do you know how many times I've been thanked in 20 years of law enforcement? He said, this was the first time. He said, judge, I just think you need to know, Mr. Kistler thanked me. The judge then did something very unusual. He looked up at me and said, Mr. Kistler, i tell you what I'm going to do. 
He said, I'm going to waive this ticket. Which doesn't mean I'm, you know, I'm going to do this with it, okay? Not W-A-V-E, W-A-I-V-E. It's legal term. I'm going to dismiss, basically, this ticket. He said, all I'm going to ask you to do is step outside to the lady sitting just outside this room in the desk and pay her five bucks for court costs, which is all it was then, and you're free to go. I said, you mean like right now? He said, yes, sir. All you have to do is pay five bucks, court cost, you're free to go. I said, you mean that's it and I'm done? He said, yes, sir, you're done. You're taking up time in my courtroom. Would you please go? Yes, sir, I will. I went out there and paid out my five bucks, got in my car and drove home. Now, folks, won't you listen to me? You know what that was? That was grace. That was grace. See, I was guilty of an offense. But the judge, who's really the only one that can do this, let me go free. Do you understand if you're saved tonight, you stood one day before the judge of all the earth. His name is God, Jehovah God. And you were guilty of sin like I was. And sin demands a payment. I deserve to go to hell. But the Bible says, my advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, stepped up, and I'm not trying to be in any way disrespectful, but he basically says, Father, Dave has trusted me as Savior. Joe has trusted me as Savior. So based on that, and I can name anybody else in here that knows the Lord, because they've trusted me as Savior, my blood has been applied to their account. And based on that, the Father looks at us and says, free to go. Can I hear an amen? Wow. Every day of your life, if you can't thank God for anything else, you ought to thank God for forgiveness from the penalty of your sin. Now there's the second thing. I want you to take your Bible, look if you would please at Romans 7. Romans chapter number 7. There is a second thing we ought to have, an attitude of gratitude or a spirit of thanksgiving for. Look at Romans chapter number 7. I want you to see this with your own eyes. Not only forgiveness from the penalty of our sin, but number 2, I want you to watch this, freedom from the power of sin. Freedom from the power of sin. You see, Brother Dave, where do you get that? Why do you say that? Look at Romans 7. Let your eyes rest on verse number 22. Now stay with me. This is very important. Again, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, Paul the Apostle writes these words. Now, don't you watch verse 22, Romans 7. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now, folk, look up at me. Plain and simple, that means this. Paul said, since I've become a believer... On the inside, I delight in God's law. I want to do God's law. By the way, if you're saved, you'll want to do what God says in His Word. Can I hear an amen? Do we always do what God says? No. But I will tell you this, at least on the inside, if we're a believer, we want to obey God. Right? You don't sound convinced. If you're saved, at least on the inside, you'll want to obey God. Right? Okay, now, Paul had a problem, same problem I've got, same one you've got. Look at the rest of verse 22. Let's read it again. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now watch verse 23. Here's the problem. But I see another law. In my members. He's talking about his physical members. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members. Warring. Literally at war. Against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, look at me for a minute. Paul is saying this. On the inside, I want to please God. But i got a problem. And the problem is in my members, my physical body, my flesh. Plain English, my flesh don't want to please God. Does yours? Mine doesn't. You know what, Brother Tim? It's an amazing thing. I can get up every morning. Every morning. This is me personally. You probably get to, I can get up every morning and hit the exercise room on Sunday morning. I can sleep in a little bit, maybe a little longer than normal. Not much, but a little bit. And you know what? My body is, oh, it's tired. Do you know Sunday before I came here to preach on Sunday morning? I'd driven up the night before. I was up kind of late. I'm always up late. That's just my life, okay? But on Sunday morning, I thought, oh, my goodness, my back. Oh, my goodness. I've got to get over to the church, and I hope they're going to be kind to me because, and you always are, but you know, I'm just, I'm tired. And you know what? I got here, and my spirit was rejuvenated by just being around you. 
All right? And the Holy Spirit gives his strength. Have you ever noticed you're tireder on Sunday morning or more tired? Is the correct English? Then you are in your the day. Of the week. Have you ever noticed the devil prompts controversy in the car on the way to church? You ever notice that? I mean, you can't. You've, you've gone all week and had an argument. Hadn't had one, but on Sunday morning, some starts right. She knows your hot button. So does the devil, by the way, and he'll prompt her. Well, the devil knows her hot button. He'll prompt you to try to push that. And you know what? You'll have an argument on the way to the church. You get to the church, everybody asks how you're doing. Man, we just lie, don't we? We lie. Oh, I'm doing awesome. What I'm trying to tell you is this. On the inside, you want to please God, right? But your flesh doesn't want to. I see another law in my members. It's warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Look at the next verse. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, folks, look up at me for a minute. I want to explain something to you. Who shall deliver me literally from this dead corpse, this dead body? You know what Paul is doing? I mean, it's a powerful illustration, and I wish I had time to go into all of it, and I'm not going to do it. But he's likening his sinful flesh to a decaying, rotting corpse. And he's basically saying, I feel at times like I'm trying to walk around, carry around a decaying, rotting corpse. That's what my flesh feels like. Do any of you ever feel that way and just get frustrated with you? Listen, the older I get, the less frustrated I am with other people. And the more frustrated I get with just me. Man, if I could just take care of me. That's a full-time job, right? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can deliver? Who can give me victory over me? Look at the next verse. I, what's the word? Thank my God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, folk, plain English. Who can give me victory over me? I thank God, says Paul. Jesus can. Can I hear an amen? Now, folk, listen to me. This is powerful stuff. You and I do not have to give in. To us. Can I repeat that? You and I do not have to give in to us. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Have any of you ever driven in California? California? Am I speaking truth? Have you driven in California? Those people are crazy out there. Yes, they are. Left coast, land of fruits and nuts, whatever you want to call it. They're crazy. Try, not just driving a car, try driving a Ford F-350 Crew Cab Dually 7.3 liter turbocharged. Oh, that sends a chill up my spine. 7.3 liter turbocharged diesel engine pickup truck with a 40 foot, 18,000 pound plus trailer behind you. Try to get that onto the on-ramp of the interstate, I-5, outside Los Angeles. You know what? It doesn't go like your car. You don't step it and it scratches off. No. It takes you from here to North Carolina to get that trailer moving. You know what I'm saying? And you know what? People in California, they're not patient at all. And the first time I tried to get that thing onto the I-5, guy started at the back bumper of the trailer, and he was sitting on the horn, and I could hear him as he came around. It was faint at first, but it got louder. And as he went by, you know, he's giving me all kind of choice hand signals. You know what I'm talking about? First time that happens as he's going by, I'm apologizing, Brother Kim. I'm sorry. Next time it happens, it starts at the back bumper, soft, yeeing, he's going by saying, you know, thing. I wasn't quite as patient. I said, you try driving one of these. Couldn't hear me, of course, but I felt better. Third time, I hear the horn beating. Miss Cindy, I literally looked at Betsy. I said, honey, would you steer? I'm standing on the running board. I'm waiting for him as he comes by. Give him a piece of my mind. My wife said, honey, you better not give away too many pieces. You can't afford a lot of that. What I'm trying to tell you is I'm made out of flesh like you are. Well, who can give me victory over me? Who can give you victory over you? Jesus. Well, the question I have now is this. How do I get victory over me? How do I say no to what my flesh wants and yes to what Jesus wants? That's a great question, isn't it? How do I say no to what I want in anything? Temper, man, I want to, I want to unload on that guy. 
By the way, preacher, I, got, I told you a little bit about this. I was at Cracker Barrel. How many of you love Cracker Barrel like I do? Grilled catfish. Turnip greens and corn. Cornbread, butter, and blackberry jam. Pardon me. Glory. Yeah. Strawberry jam. Who said that? We'll put a little strawberry on top of the blackberry. I'll try that. That's good. Listen. Cracker Barrel to me is a little bit of heaven on earth. I'm at Cracker Barrel, Morganton, North Carolina. I walk into the restroom to wash my hands after a Sunday morning church service. And standing there is a guy I know. He goes to church with me. I said, hey, brother. He didn't say anything back. I washed my hands, grabbed a towel to dry them, and he walked up to me and said, I need to say something to you. I said, okay. Do you know he unloaded on me? He said, I don't like you. And he said, best thing in my estimation you could do is take your family and move on down the road. I said, well, forgive me, sir, but I said, I, I love you, brother. I really do. But I said, let me say this. You're not the one that determines what God does in my life. He's the one that determines that. So I, I understand what you're saying. Maybe you disagree with a decision I made, which he did. But I said, you're not the one that tells me what God wants. And he wanted to, I said, look, this is not the time and this is not the place. My bride's waiting on me and I'm assuming you have family waiting on you. If you want to get together at a later time, we'll be glad to talk. But this is not the time and the place. He wouldn't stop. I finally just literally had to do this. I had to take his hand in my hand and say, brother, I don't care what you're saying to me. I love you and I'm going to go enjoy some grilled catfish. In fact, I was going to have one helping. I'm having two now. I'm going to need two. I'm going to enjoy some grilled catfish and Cracker Barrel sweet tea with my bride. Now, I want you to listen to me because I'm made out of the same stuff you are. I get to the table. My wife said, where you been? I said, well, here's what happened. I explained to her what had occurred. She said, I can't believe that. What was he upset about? And I said, well, it had to do, I guess, with a decision I made. And, you know, guys, I'm just being honest with you. There's not sometimes an upside to being involved in certain things and just speaking truth. Not every, Have you discerned not everybody's happy with you when you speak truth? I don't care how much you smile. They're not always happy. Are you with me? And this was one of those times. That's okay. Thank God for my wife, who was the voice of the Holy Spirit that day. She said, were you upset? I said, was I upset? I said, yes. She said, you didn't say anything, did you? I said, no, thankfully I did not this time. She said, tell me what you did say. I said, all I told him was, I love you, brother. This is not the time or the place. If you want to get together later, that's fine. But I love you. I'm going to have lunch with my bride. She said, praise God. Praise God. She said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to put his head right there between those mitts and clamp down. This is really the voice of the Holy Spirit. She said, you know what we need to do? Aren't you thankful for your wife? Aren't you thankful for your wife, guys? She said, you know what we need to do? We need to find out where they're sitting in the restaurant. We need to buy their meal. I said, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> I said, no, honey, you're right. That's what we need to do. So that's what we did to this day. To this day, I don't know if they put two and two together. It doesn't matter if they do. To this day, we did that. It was the right decision. Can I hear an amen? Now listen, listen, it's very important. My flesh... My sinful flesh was screaming Italian. But on the inside, the Holy Spirit was going, uh, uh, uh. Don't go there. Don't, uh, don't do that. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Don't, don't go there. If you do, you're going to mess up what I can do, and what I can do is way better than what you can do. Are you, have you ever learned that? Just leave it alone. Sister, your testimony was so powerful. That just let God deal with it. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Well, how do I do that? How do I make that choice? Now, don't turn to Romans 8, one chapter over. Just listen. In Romans 8, Paul says this, and it's the key to freedom from the power of sin. Paul says this, whoever you yield yourself to, that's whose servant you will be. If you yield your body as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin, 
then don't be surprised, Paul says, you're going to serve sin because you yielded your body to it. But if you yield your members as an instrument of righteousness to God, you can serve God. Can I hear an amen? You say, preacher, make that practical. Okay, I'm going to try. It means this. Tonight on the way home, if you have to stop by a convenience store or you stop by McDonald's at the bottom of the hill to grab you a cup of coffee and the service is contrary to what it's been the last couple of nights when I stopped through there to grab something to drink, it's been stellar. And the kids that work there have been awesome. I just want to say that. They have. But if tonight they're slower and you're tempted to get upset, just remember whoever you yield yourself to. That's who servants you'll become. So instead of yielding your mind and especially yielding your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness to the devil to say some smart comment. By the way, any of you cursed like I am with a sharp tongue? My wife tells me all the time, I hope you don't say all the stuff you think. I said, no, no, I've tried to exercise a little discernment with respect to that. But preacher, I'm just telling you, I've worked on Capitol Hill too long. I want to say stuff. You know what I'm saying? I just want to say stuff. Well, if you yield your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin, you're going to end up serving sin, right? But if you yield your tongue as an instrument of righteousness to God, you can serve Him. So instead of unloading, as you go up to the window and you pay, why don't you say this, man, I'm sure you've had a rough day if you've been here a little while. I just want to thank you for what you're doing. Wow. Wow. Get pulled over by a police officer? Man, I want to thank you. Try this one, Brother Tim. I bet nobody ever told you this. Romans 13. Last time I was pulled over, I shouldn't tell you this. I told you I've been pulled over. Anyway, last time I was pulled over, I said to the officer, I said, can I say something to you, sir? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I was speeding. I'm guilty. Okay, I, that's out of the way. Write me. Whatever you got to write. But I said, I also want to tell you something. I'm, I'm the president of Hope Ministries International. We love law enforcement, and we do. We support our men in blue. Can I hear an amen? And I said, I want to tell you something. Romans 13 says that you, sir, are a minister of God for good. That's what Romans 13 says. You're a minister. You're working in God. You're a minister of God for good. And what you're doing in enforcing the law, even in my situation, you're being a minister of God for good. He said, well, I'm not going to give you a ticket. I said, no, 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 no. That's not why I was saying that. You do what you've got to do. I'm just saying I'm thankful for you. Do you know that changes the whole dynamic, doesn't it? Whoever you yield yourself to, that's who servant you'll be. Do any of you remember the movie Fireproof? Remember where the guy playing the husband, he's struggling with pornography on the computer, and he takes his computer, big old monitor, sets it on a table outside, grabs his baseball bat, and looks across, and there's his neighbor watching it. Remember that funny scene? And he still just takes a bat and beats the computer up. You know what that's called in the theological realm? That's called radical amputation. Okay? It means if I got a problem and I know what the problem is, it's my computer, radically amputate that problem and get rid of it. Can I hear an amen? Hey, if you can't control the TV, get rid of it, right? It's called radical amputation. Whoever I yield my eyes to, that's whose servant I'll become. So I'm not going to allow my eyes to watch certain things. Does it mean I have to get rid of my TV? No, but there's a great thing called remotes. It's got on, off, and mute. Those are two buttons we all learn to master. Can I hear an amen? Whoever you yield yourself to, that's who servants you're going to be. I ought to have an attitude of gratitude for forgiveness from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin. One last thing, and I'm not going to even have you turn. I just want you to listen. In fact, I am going to have you turn one place. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. Philippians chapter number 1. I do want you to see this with your own eyes. There's a third thing. We ought to have a spirit of thanksgiving every day of our life. Four. Forgiveness from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin. Third thing. Look at Philippians 1. Let your eyes drop down to verse number 3. Paul says, I, what's the word again? Thank, my God, upon every remembrance of you, 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 you Philippian believers, Verse 4, always, in other words, I thank God for you all the time, always and in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. Every time I pray, Paul said, I thank God for you guys. Well, what specifically about them does he thank God? Look at verse number 5. For, here it is, what I thank God 
for about you is, I thank God for your fellowship in the gospel. From the first day till now. Now look up at me for a minute, would you? Let me give you the last part of the outline. Forgiveness from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin. Number three, Paul said, I thank God for fellowship with the people of God. Every day, Philippians, and by the way, you do know Philippians was a prison epistle. Paul was in prison, brother, when he wrote it. And if you read the rest of the book, Paul said, later in Philippians, he said, you know, you folks have sent once and again to my, my necessity while I've been in prison. He said, one time you sent the odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice well-pleasing and acceptable unto God. There's some debate about what that was. was. Did they send him some kind of incense or was it just a gift that Paul considered to be an odor of sweet? I mean, what? it was a dank prison. Probably it was a literal smell. Something to make the room smell better. Paul said, you guys are always doing that for me. And he said, I want you to know every time I pray, I thank God for you. And what I thank God for specifically is your fellowship in the gospel from the very first time I met you until right now. Wow. Fellowship. By the way, it's the Greek word koinonia. Koinonia. Fellowship. Koino What's koinonia, Brother Dave? Koinonia is mutual participation. Mutual participation. Let me ask it this way. Um, do you have a, a room here at Daniel's Missionary called the Fellowship Hall? Well, where is it at? It's downstairs? Is, is it a good size room? Okay, do you have tables that you put food on when you have, and I love this, when you have a fellowship dinner? Is that, is that what y'all call them? Some people call them potlucks. Do y'all call them potlucks? Okay. But do you call them fellowship dinners, potluck dinners? I mean, what, what, what term do you use? Meet and greet. No, no, anyway, yeah. eat, meet, and greet. Okay, what? Well, no. We call them in our church a fellowship dinner in the fellowship hall. You ever thought about that? Koinonia, mutual participation. Put a bunch of tables together. Everybody brings a potluck item. They set it on a common table. And then somebody's called on to pray. Now, don't answer this out loud, but have you ever opened one eye during the prayer or the fellowship dinner? Preacher, why should I open one eye? Because interesting stuff happens during the prayer. People are jockeying for position. You know, when the amen is said, they're getting ready, right? Especially if they got fried chicken on the table. I'm going to be like a locust. I'm going to get to the fried chicken. I love fried chicken. Somebody told me one time, you know what a belt is on a preacher? I said, no. They said it's a leather fence around a chicken graveyard. That's what that is. Hey, that's true. I like that. Yeah, during the prayer, everybody's getting ready. When they amen, <laughs> there they go. They're having a little bit of that, spoonful of that, chicken leg over here, a oh, slice of ham there, and then down at the end, oh, if they have the heavenly coconut cream pie, we're going to get two slices of that <laughs> on our plate. Do you know what you'll never see at a fellowship dinner? You'll never see this, ever, ever. You'll not see Sister Smith standing along the table where her bucket of chicken is. And she's guarding her bucket of chicken. And when you come to have one, she takes her hand and back off. Back off. That's my chicken. No. Nobody guards their green beans. They don't guard their biscuits, do they? No, they don't stand guard over it. They want you to have some. Because this is a fellowship dinner, right? We mutually participate here together. No, you'll never see that, but I'll tell you what you will see. I saw this over in Tennessee. Sarah Jackson, preacher was her name. She's with the Lord now. She was the best maker of coconut cream pie I've ever seen in my life. And she knew I loved it. But she'd make up coconut cream pie. And I was at that fellowship dinner and I sat near the dessert table because really interesting stuff happens there. And she had a little plate with her wedge of coconut cream pie in it. She had a fork in her right hand. And she was pacing back and forth in front of the dessert table. And she was talking like she was talking to herself. But she wasn't talking to herself. She was talking loud enough on purpose that everybody could hear her. And what she was saying was this. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. She's looking at the plate. And out loud, Brother Joe, she said this. I wonder who made that coconut cream pie. She made it. I saw her bring it in. 
You know what she's trying to do? She's trying to drum up some business for her coconut cream pie, right? Come get some. Why? Because this is a fellowship dinner. Now, I've often wondered, why can't we take that concept out of the gym and bring it here? You mean preacher bring food in here? No. Not what I'm talking about. Why can't we bring the concept here? Why can't we bring our time and our talents and our gifts and our abilities and lay them not on a table but at an altar and say to both God and preacher, say it to God because He's your heavenly Father, say it to pastor because He's the one that down here will be greatly blessed. And by the way, you will be too. Why can't we say to both God and preacher, hey, here's, here's my time. It's on the altar. God, if you need a little of my time, preacher, if you need me for something, why don't you come take a spoonful of my time? Does anybody agree with me? Pardon me. Okay, I'll do this. Amen, Brother Dave. That's good stuff. It's going to take me twice as long to finish up here if you don't help me. It's truth, isn't it? Come on. Oh, you look so much better with a smile on your face. Look. It's true, isn't it? It's true. We're a fellowship of believers. This is not one or two people carrying the load. Any more than one or two people bring a few things for the how successful would a fellow how successful would fifth quarter be if only two people brought something? Not very. No, how successful can the church be if only a couple of people carrying the load? How powerful can it be if everybody contributes? Can I hear an amen? Wow. Fellowship. And the people of God. Wow. See, it goes way deeper than just food. It's talking about service. We don't serve mutually together. Now, one final thing. I'm just going to mention it. We're done. Forgiveness from the penalty of sin. Freedom from the power of sin. Fellowship with the people of God. As I was reading through the scripture, trying to find out, what do I need to be thankful for, Lord, every day? Because I'm plagued by the same thing everybody else is. What do I need to thank you for? At least these things every day. Well, these three, one more. Food. Food, the provision of God. Forgiveness from the penalty of sin. Freedom from the power of sin. Fellowship with the people of God. Food. The provision of God. You say, preacher, you're talking about physical food? I am. But I'm not just talking about that. Tonight I had a great meal with a dear couple. Last night I had an awesome meal with a dear couple. Yesterday morning, Pastor Tim and I had an awesome breakfast, late breakfast after we went and did a workout. Can I say this, folks? I know we're so blessed in America that we do this all the time. But I said to him and I said to these folks, I said, I want to thank you so much for your kindness to me and the awesome meal and the great fellowship. Meal was awesome. Fellowship was better. Folk, I hope we don't ever get over that. Brother Tim, did you know there are six times when Jesus himself thanked his heavenly Father? Six times recorded in the gospel. Six. Four of the six. Four of the six times Jesus thanked his heavenly Father. Four of the six times he does that are for physical food. On the road to Emmaus, he joined himself with those two disciples. They get to the end where they're going to go in. Jesus made it as he would go further. And they said, no, turn in and go in. So he goes in with them. They sit down in the meal. They said, would you return thanks? Preacher, yes. In the end of that prayer, he vanishes out of their sight. And they realize this was Jesus. But he started his prayer by thanking his heavenly father. For something he could have snapped into existence. See, we normally thank people for stuff we either have not or cannot provide for ourselves. Jesus didn't need anybody to do anything for Him. He's God, robed in human flesh. But He thanked His Father for physical food. Wow. I don't know about you, that's powerful. Not only physical food, the provision of God. I want to go one step further and I'm done. Spiritual food. Spiritual food, the provision of God. Probably not a one of us in this room that would think of going one day without having at least one meal. 
most of us have three. They say three square meals a day. I want to change that to three round meals a day. You know what I'm talking about? We have at least one, most of the time three, a day. And yet we don't give a second thought a lot of time about going through a week. Perhaps without even partaking of the spiritual food. Do you understand now why Paul told Timothy maybe a little better? Why he told Timothy in the last days the culture is going to be overrun by ingratitude. Unthankful. I could go a lot of places. But I want to say this. I love that flag right there. I love that flag. I don't know if I've told you this yet, but I love that flag. You know why? Because it represents something. Well, we're not a perfect country. No, we're not. Never have been, never will be. But I love that flag. Because she represents liberty and freedom and concepts, ideals, that the rest of the world, most of them know very little about, and we are overloaded with the blessing. So you know what? When old glory goes by, or I'm at a ball game, or I'm at the Hickory Motor Speedway because my son's been asked to come sing the national anthem, it's not just because he's singing it, but when it's played, or so, I don't care where it is, my hand goes over my heart, and I stand at attention, and I sing generally. I don't sing well, but I sing. God bless America, Star Spangled Banner. I sing our national anthem. Anthem when it is sung or played. You know why? Because I'm thankful for how good God's been to me. Do you have an attitude of gratitude? Every day you ought to thank God for these four things forgiveness, freedom, fellowship, food, both physical and spiritual. Every day. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second. Father, would you speak to us tonight? Lord, like so many times, I fear. We've been so blessed by access to the Bible. Lord, we've lived in a country that's had so much access to really outstanding preaching. It's on radio, it's on TV. Lord, I know this church, if its history is any indication, and I'm sure it is, the very best preachers in the world have been brought at some point into this pulpit. Lord, if we're not careful, we've heard so much, participated in so much, enjoyed so much, that we no longer are grateful for it. We take it for granted. We just assume it's always been this way, it's always going to be this way. But Lord, that may not be the case at all. So Father, I pray you'd speak to my heart tonight. And make me, Lord, in the days ahead, more grateful than I have ever been. For these four things and a whole lot more. But Lord, this is a starting point. What I'm asking you, Lord, to do is a great work in our life to cultivate in us and to cause us to do the things necessary to allow you to cultivate in us an attitude of gratitude. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do. Now, folks, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm about to ask you a question. I want you to be brutally honest. Before I ask it, there was a statement made by the founder of the college and seminary I went to. And the statement he made was this. It's powerful. It's true. When gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. When gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. And here's why he said that. Because Romans 1 says this, 
even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They became certain things. And the first thing listed before you ever get down the list to homosexuality, before you ever get to rampant immorality in a culture, before you ever get anywhere close to that, the first step downward is this. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And then God says, they're given up to vile affections. The women changing the natural use into that which is against nature. There's that phrase again. Crime against nature. But it started with something we don't think's that big. Neither were thankful. 36 years, folks, has taught me a lot. I've sat in the rooms of many a man, of many a woman, who at one time was living aggressively for God. And now they're in a place where you don't even hardly recognize that they were ever a person that lived for God. And I can guarantee you every time, every time, every time, no exception, every time. They didn't just arrive there in one step. No, there were many steps, but the first one, the first downward step they took was they ceased being thankful. Now I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. How would you categorize yourself? Better yet, maybe I should word it this way. How would the people who know you best categorize you? What I mean is this. Would they say of you, sir, ma'am, if I ask them about you? The people that know you best. Would they say, yes, he, she's a thankful person. And I know that because they verbalize it a lot. They thank God. They thank others. They live a life of gratitude. Yes, he or she is a thankful person. Are you that? Would others say that about you? Those who know you the best. Now, I just want you to be brutally honest. Just brutally honest. If you can say, yes, Brother Dave, I believe those who know me best would say that I'm a thankful person. I verbalize it a lot to God and to others. I believe they would say I'm a thankful person because I verbalize it a lot to God and others. If that's really true, now just be, just be honest. Don't worry about what somebody else thinks. Don't even worry about what I think. Just be honest before God. Yes, Brother Dave, I'm a thankful person. I verbalize it a lot to God and to others. If that's really true, really true. Would you lift your hand? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being transparent and honest. Ten people. And I, I believe you. I believe you. I do. There's more than ten of us in the room now. Now I want to do something tonight. I'm not doing this casually. I'm not doing it in any way coincidentally. I'm doing it deliberately. You know what's going on in your heart. And if you could not say, in all honesty... I'm thankful to God and to others. And I verbalize it a lot. I verbalize it a lot. To God and to others, how thankful I am. In other words, if you know you need to work on your gratitude quotient, I wonder if you'd be willing to do this tonight. In the quietness of this moment, as the Holy Spirit speaks, I wonder if you'd be willing just to get up from where you're currently seated. 
and just join me down here, one made out of the same stuff you are, at this altar and just say, oh God, you've spoken to me tonight.